Good morning and good afternoon for some of you. I'm Liz Ecker with Senior Housing News, and I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Market Feasibility Disrupted, Rethinking Industry Norms. Today we'll hear from several experts on this topic, whom I'd like to briefly introduce. We will hear from Dana Wolschlager, who is a principal with Plant Moran Living Forward. We'll hear from Lana Peck, who is senior principal with National Investment Center for Seniors Housing and Care. And we will hear from Jamie Tamadio, who is a VP with Plant Moran Living Forward. In terms of today's presentation, first we'll hear from our panel, and then we will open the floor for audience question and answers. Please feel free to type and submit questions as you have them for our panel, and we will get to as many as we can during the Q&A portion of the webinar. A recording of the presentation, as well as the slides, will be made available shortly after the conclusion of today's webinar, so please look out for an email with a link to the slides and instructions for accessing those materials. A big thank you to Plant Moran Living Forward for bringing this webinar to us today. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dana. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Liz, and good morning and good afternoon to um, all of the listeners uh, on the webinar today. Uh, we are really excited about um, starting a conversation about the market feasibility research and really the, the impact, and I, I'll say significant impact, the data and the results of the market study can have on a senior living community or a, a new project that you might be considering uh, developing. So um, over the years, uh, almost a decade now, we've done more than 200 uh, plus market studies throughout the country. And um, over that time period, our market feasibility practice has evolved. And I think, um, I think many uh, market feasibility experts, their, their market studies have evolved as well they should. Um, um, because this is a very dynamic, ever-changing industry. So, you know, quite honestly, as an industry, I'm not sure that we've completely appreciated how data-rich these reports are. And oftentimes, as, as a developer or an owner or operator, we simply focus on the demand uh, results, and then we move forward. But today, we really want to talk about the data in these reports, and very specifically, we want to talk about some other considerations um, that should be factored into market feasibilities um, that are being done as we continue to move forward in this ever-changing uh, healthcare industry. I, I'm afraid that I don't think that the status quo is going to be sufficient um, in the future to, to um, ensure success. So very specifically, as we move through our presentation, we want to talk about defining the market area and spend a little time focusing on that and, and some of the nuances tied to it. We want to talk um, about supply and demand. We want to talk about non-income assets or net worth. And then we really want to spend um, the balance of that time then talking about labor market considerations. So we've got a packed uh, agenda today, and we're going to try and get through it all. Um, we wanted to start, however, with a um, question. Uh, and you should have the ability to um, check the answer that most uh, applies to you. And the question is, what is the most important factor that you look for in a market study? Is it unit potential or unit demand? Is it competition intelligence, understanding what all your competitors are doing in the market area? Is it just getting a better sense of what the demographics look like for your specific market or primary market area? Or is it the penetration rate? Uh, so it, it'll help us sort of set the stage for what people are specifically looking for in a market study. So we'll give you just a moment to uh, rate that for us. And Liz, will we be able to see the results right away? Yep. They're coming up now. Perfect. Boy, this is interesting. So really kind of evenly spread a, a, across... Um, all four of those answers, which is really interesting. Okay, great. Well, I, I think a lot of the information that we're going to share today um, will, will help any one of those categories um, as it relates to what you might be looking for. Um, so in terms of just kind of kicking this off, um, and setting the stage, you know, our, our market research team um, recognizes that we're speaking to several different audiences, um, and, the, and the, demo, the information that we're pulling together for them 
um, everybody has a different perspective or a different lens that they're looking through. Whether you're the investor, a lending institution, an owner, an operator, or a developer, everybody um, is looking at it from a, a slightly different perspective. And so we're going to talk about all of those perspectives today and how um, the answers that are generated in these market studies um, really help people make good decisions. I, what I really want to make sure that people take away from the conversation that we're having today is that you know, what we are talking about today should not in any way suggest that the way we've been doing market feasibility work um, is wrong. Um, because you know, we, I, think that, I think that the standards and the methodology that's used to help define market areas and, and penetration and, and demand um, is, is a very sophisticated process and clearly uh, there's a lot of art and science that goes into it. What we're simply suggesting today is that given the rapidly changing landscape of this industry, um, it's possible we should be digging deeper into other areas to make sure that we actually get it right. We haven't been doing it wrong, but I think that we need to look at some other other components. I think we got to make sure we keep in mind too all of, with, especially I don't think it's any surprise to any of us with the massive amount of new development and new entrance into this industry. Um, making sure that we look at some case, we're gonna have some case studies in this in this uh, presentation that'll walk us through market studies that follow the industry norms that maybe just didn't question the status quo enough as we move through these. Good point, good point, Jamie. Which is a great segue into this next slide, which really does talk um, about um, the increase post-recession that we've experienced as an industry um, relative to the for-profit sector versus the not-for-profit sector. The, the top graph demonstrates the, the for-profit growth in terms of the total number of properties um, that have uh, come online since uh, third quarter of 2008. Um, stretching all the way out through 2000, third quarter of 2016. And you can see the, the significant uh, impact that the for-profit providers have had uh, in our market area. The bottom portion of the graph demonstrates uh, the total number of units um, that have come online or been constructed um, since third quarter 2008. And so you can see that, um, that there's just been significant growth um, those of you that pay attention to, to a lot of the NIC reports know um, that, that these are pieces that we've been keeping an eye on as it relates to trends, and I don't, I don't know that it's going to slow down anytime soon. Um, and part of, part of the reason why I think that matters and really speaks to the point that Jamie was trying to make is there are a lot of new entrants into this marketplace, and, and uh, the NIC data um, supports um, that there is, we have added 596 new properties to MSAs just since 2014 alone. And when you look at the breakout of that, 50% um, of those 290 or 596 um, new properties are um, individuals or organizations that have two or less properties. And so, you know, again, I, 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 I hate to suggest that there are less sophisticated and more sophisticated uh, owners and operators and organizations out there, but uh, it, it, it's hard to, um, to think that uh, folks that have one or two properties um, really have as, as good an understanding of this very complicated healthcare industry as someone who's got a portfolio of 10 or more. So um, I also think, honestly, that this is going to be an opportunity in the future. If those properties don't do well, there's going to be an opportunity for some pretty good um, mergers or acquisitions. So um, you'll want to start tracking where those 596 new properties are and, and keep track of, of how well they're doing in their market area. So one of the first sections we want to touch on is how we go about defining our market area. And I think there are the two most common, I believe, um, market area definitions is typically folks who you'd use a polygon or uh, possibly like a radius around a certain project site where they're looking to develop. Um, oftentimes, if they don't take a true radius around a site, that polygon might be limited based on certain, certain barriers, such as like a river that cuts through on area or a, a highway, um, train tracks, those, those are very common barriers that might limit a market area definition. Um, I think that a lot of times we know that most of our residents relocate within uh, 10 miles of their uh, existing where they currently reside. 
So the first might be, let's look at if it's a new community coming into the market, they might use a polygon or might just take a very generic uh, approach and just use a radii, which, which I don't believe or most people wouldn't recommend just using a, a generic market uh, definition that way. What we want to make sure is we're really paying attention to this because if we think about how we define our market areas, that is truly the underlying assumptions that are setting, the, setting up the uh, foundation for our market studies for the demographics that we pull, the penetration rates we're going to calculate, the competition we're going to factor in, and all the new planned projects that are coming online. So making sure we get this right is very important. The second most common approach I would believe would be folks who may have an existing community and they uh, look at their, where their residents originate from. Uh, we know that we want to make all of our, so if we're looking at it from a zip code perspective, and we see where do our re existing residents originate from, from a zip code perspective, we typically will take contiguous zip codes around our project site um, and oftentimes fall somewhere between 60 and 90 percent of wherever those, the 69 percent of our current residents relocate from, that would make up our market area. It was interesting, Dana and I had a conversation with a Catholic organization this morning who um, uh, actually, funny, had an archbishop on the phone and he was very interested in capturing, when we pulled the demographics to make sure that they had all of the competition, not just in their primary market area, but also um, well outside the general region. So that's something that we did talk about uh, in, excess, in excess with him a bit. But So what we want to do is talk to a case study where someone uses um, the existing market area, so this is a client, a, a case study of something that was developed here in a large metropolitan area um, in Chicago, and they were doing a brand new campus development. And what they did is they were, they were an entry fee community, so what they looked at, as many of us would often do, is they took where were the majority of the depositors uh, coming from that they were receiving deposits from. And when they looked at how many depositors they had uh, polling, they had... 99 people that had registered their um, or, or put up a deposit to move into this entry fee community. 67 of them, 67% roughly of, the, of all those depositors made up this primary market area that's here, that's highlighted here in pink on this map. And what we've also done is we overlaid on this map drive times, which is another way that typically people will look at how they define their market area. And you can see in a greater metropolitan area like Chicago, um, a drive time of 20 minutes plus uh, may raise a lot of red flags in, in some of our minds. What was interesting is the bankers and everyone was able to get comfortable with this because this was following that standard process of accepting um, that percentage of people that were saying they were going to move in. Uh, it allowed them to kind of pass that, that initial test. <clears throat> what we wanted to do, though, is compare that particular market study that was completed um, with 39 other market studies that we did. So what we have here is a, each blue dot on this graph represents a market study or different market that was performed. And oftentimes what you find is the further left you are against that y-axis, you're in a more urban area, i.e. maybe potentially Chicago. The more further right you are on the x-axis, you're in a more rural area. And well, the way this chart lays out is the x-axis represents square miles, and you can see we also have a dotted line uh, that goes across there that would make up essentially the radius around the project site. So you can kind of get some context of how large um, a particular market area might be defined as. And then the, the, the y-axis is made up of population density. And what you can see is obviously as you get to a more rural area, your population density might shrink because there's less people who live out there, which may allow you to expand your particular uh, market area and add more zip codes than maybe someone in a more, or more uh, urban area. When we looked at how that previous uh, market area fell on this chart, you can see here on the, by the green dot, it is well above our, our average curve, um, which would kind of raise a big red flag because you can see out of the 39 other market studies that we did here, we're really, it's really kind of falling as a, as a big out, outlier here. So it's just another way to analyze the data to make sure that you're not just accepting as an uh, industry norm because it's, it's always accepted. We really want to make sure we're always looking at something um, from multiple different perspectives to make sure that, that everything seems to make sense. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, demand and supply and then turn it back over to Jamie. But uh, 
the first thing I want to do is just give you a little bit of background. You know, we've, a lot of weight is put on the importance of the calculation of net need in market feasibility studies, but you know, at its simplest and most basic, net need really isn't the bottom line answer that most market consumers uh, assume it to be, you know, when they get that report in hand and they proceed the thumb directly to the page that tells them how many units they can build. Um, but there are a number of different variables which, which uh, affect the results of net need calculations. Um, and those include appropriate income levels, home values, disability rates, um, target age rates. And each variable comes with its own set of assumptions. Now, while these assumptions generally aren't so weighty as to invalidate all the market study results on their own, um, then one of them is significant when it's a significant driver of positive net need, um, and that assumption is off the mark, then we have some trouble. The success or failure of a project, uh, sometimes a multi-million dollar project, is going to be on the line. So this is an example of um, a simple estimate of net need. And I think we've all seen something like this. To do this, we count up the number of age and income qualified households in the area. Here we have 10,000. And uh, because not all seniors are going to be attracted to senior housing, we need to apply an assumed penetration rate range. In this case, we're using 3 to 5 percent. And then subtract the existing supply in units in order to say whether a developer's, say, $30 million investment is a, no, a go or no-go. And also tell them whether or not they can be successful building 30 to, or sorry, 35 to 235 units, which is a very wide range to get comfortable with with so much on the line. Now, one of the key assumptions here is about penetration rate. And we know from industry data that almost, um, that most capture rates fall into three, the 3 to 5 percent range, but it does vary pretty widely across markets. Um, you know, this particular slide is, is showing um, a trend line of demand and supply if penetration rates were predictable. Basically, if they were predictable, what you'd expect to see is the trend line um, would look like this. When there are a lot of units in the marketplace, in the, the high penetration markets, there should be a lot of empty units. But on the flip side, as the penetration rate in a market drops, you could expect that you'd see occupancy increase. So if the concept of net need actually worked, what you would expect to see in those different markets is that high penetration markets would have low occupancy, and low penetration markets would have high occupancy. But there really is no correlation between the penetration rate in the market and actual occupancy, as this chart shows. What we see here is the strongest occupancies to the left, the weakest occupancies to the right, the highest penetration towards the top, the lowest towards the bottom. And instead of that nice trend line that we saw before, what we have here is markets scattered all over the place. And it, it becomes even more confusing when you see that some of the markets with high penetration also have high occupancy, and some markets with low occupancy also have low occupancy, low occupancy and low penetration. So essentially what this chart is telling us is that there are other factors involved that drive absorption of supply. And with that being said, I'm going to turn it back over to Jamie who will provide us with a, a, a lot more detail. Thanks, Lana. So I think another big piece, I, I noticed based on just on our survey results, um, the demographics and our penetration, I think we're right around 22, 23, 24 percent of the respondents were looking at that. And so Lana just spoke about how penetration rates obviously will vary uh, broadly across all of our different markets that we look at. Another thing, so you know, I don't think you ever should just look at a penetration rate and say a market is oversaturated or there is, there's a lot, there's need in this market just because a penetration rate is high or low. Um, another thing to always keep in mind is um, when we look at our demographics, the industry norm tends to always look at uh, those aged seniors who are over the age of 75. And what we have started to do in, in a lot of studies that we're starting to analyze is to make sure that we're looking at not just that, that normal benchmark number, that industry norm of 75 plus age seniors, but we're also starting to look at a lot more frequently how many seniors are over the age of 80 and even 85 plus. And you can see by this chart here, um, that left column, the residential care communities, it almost makes up 53% of the people that live in their, those communities are 85 years and over. And what we're trying to do, the reason we would look at that is because 
we're trying to predict in a market analysis not if there's demand today, not if there's demand in the next five years, but can we make sure that there is demand and there's going to be demand well into the future? And that's one of the reasons why we would want to look at this type of um, potential shift in age demographics just to make sure that uh, a transition in, in the age potential doesn't cause too much of a change in potential penetration rate we run or the, the, the number of qualified seniors that can move in. And this chart that um, is, is laid out here is looking at um, the percent growth for the different age cohorts across um, the United States. And what you can see is that teal blue line that kind of starts trending upward to the north to the northeast really um, from 2020 through 2032 is at 85 plus population. So what that really is kind of projecting is you're going to see some strong growth from your from our 85 plus population um, well into 2032. And what we're trying to make sure we're doing is we're not overestimating or over over promising maybe some of that demand that might truly be there in the next five years. So that's obviously going to affect a lot of our fill up and, and uh, we'll have a case study on some fill up stuff actually related to labor later on, but that's something we really need to make sure of is will the seniors actually be there by the time this project's up, developed, and ready to be moved into? So we're trying to predict when are they at that age where they're ready to move into our communities. <clears throat> So what we do when we look at an analysis is we'd run, we'd run a typical um, penetration rate and we'd look at that 75 plus population. And if you look at this uh, table here, that top section, you can see 9.2% and 12.9%. That's essentially looking at a penetration rate in, in the uh, example market area here where 75 uh, plus year old seniors earning more than $35,000 are looked at and to see what the penetration rate looks for that market. What we then do is we increase that age threshold to 80 plus. And the big thing that we're trying to judge here is, does that percent increase from 9.2 to 17.6 or 12.9 to 24.5? Is that an acceptable growth or is that an acceptable spread so that we feel comfortable moving in our seniors? And I think when we, when we start tracking that more regularly um, over the many different market studies we have done and are planning to do in the future, we'll start to figure out what is that acceptable spread to make sure that the markets that are filling up will meet um, that benchmark that almost, you know, maybe it's a 5%, maybe it's a 7%, maybe it's 10. We don't have that number laid out, but that is something that we're starting to analyze a lot of different data to make sure we're looking at that and really trying to predict when will these seniors be ready to move into our communities. The next uh, example, do you want to lay some? Yeah, so this is, a, this is an interesting case study. Um, it was a project that uh, was developed um, in, and opened in 2013, 2014. Um, you know, obviously we, the market study was done, um, took some time to build the project. Uh, it was located in Omaha, Nebraska, and this is the actual market study that was produced um, and demonstrated demand between um, 42 and 57 units of, of uh, assisted living. And, um, and you can see as, as below that there were um, three existing communities, um, interestingly enough, that had census um, below 90% for assisted living and memory care. And yet and still, uh, the developer decided to move forward and they, and they really kind of maxed out the total mm -hmm. number of units that they, that they could on this site. And, and uh, we're going to show you uh, another way to look at this, but the bottom line was this project defaulted on, on uh, their loan. Um, and, and so understanding these, these components tied to the market study, particularly penetration rates, is really, really important. Yeah, so what these guys did is everything that they did followed the very traditional industry norm um, penetration rates. Well, all the other calculations were done as everyone else would do them in the industry. And then they also used a 45% penetration rate for their for their uh, demand calculation. And what you can see is what it showed is in 2010 they had a 42 unit demand and in 2015 it showed it had demand for 57 units. Uh, but then what we looked at is, well let's actually look at what's occurring in this market. And you can see in the very bottom of this, of this slide they had 960 occupied assisted living and 160 occupied memory care units. Um, and 
out of the whole market, there were 3,316 units that were available for someone to move into. Basically, what that's equating to is it's showing us that they got about just shy of 34% uh, of a penetration rate. Uh, so if we looked at it and said, okay, they ran it at 45, what does it look like if we shift that number and we actually ran it at how the market was actually functioning? And what you can see here is when you shift it to the 33.78%, you now have a excess demand essentially of um, units and obviously just following this very easy calculation you would see that I wouldn't develop anything here I'll probably move on to a different market that we may be looking at um, this this particular uh, analysis just looked at one demand calculation they built, built a project and unfortunately they were they defaulted on their on their um, loan. on their loan that they had in place because they couldn't fill the building because you couldn't fill the building which which is a, obviously a major major issue we'll touch on that a couple other times so big takeaways from the demand and supply section. Obviously, make sure you're very sound on your assumptions. Uh, um, have a conversation several times if you're an owner operator. Really making sure you define that market area um, because you want to make sure that you're capturing everything correctly. Run your sensitivities. A couple of examples we showed you to make sure you run sensitivities. Uh, Dana mentioned on one of the slides previously that looking at occupancy. So the one market showed that three communities were functioning at below 90% occupancy. There's obviously a lot of factors. Maybe they're going through fill-up, um, which wasn't the case, but that could be happening in a particular market. But also look at the trend of occupancies. And I think oftentimes what we look at too much is just a snapshot in time. Hey, this current market area has a 92% occupancy or a, um, an 88%, whatever it might be. It falls in line with industry benchmarks, and we give it a check mark and move on. Let's look at the actual trend, though, because even if it's at 93%, but a year ago it was at 96, and six months ago it was at 93, and then we're down to 90. That's that to me would start to raise some red flags. What's going on? Is there too many units coming online? Are there uh, are properties just really old? No one's living moving there. They're moving to other sites. So making sure we're looking at more of the occupancy trends, which a lot of market studies um, do not include. So we want to make sure we start including that. And then the last piece here um, is one thing that Nick always is. is presenting on, on their website and in a lot of their webinars and it's something we include in all of our market studies is looking at the percentage of current units under construction as a percentage of, uh, of existing inventory. <clears throat> and basically all you do is, in this example, you can see you have 255 independent living units currently being constructed and there are currently 1,400 roughly existing units which equates to 18% uh, percent of construction under uh, of construction versus inventory. How does that compare? We always want to make sure we're comparing it to something. So you can see nationally that average is about 4%. Detroit, for this, which is where this analysis was being done, was at 2%. And then the highest across uh, all similar sized markets for a um, primary market was 23%. However, if you look at your assisted living, you can see they were at 28% and um, Detroit was at 22, then Trenton, New Jersey was at 65. So compare it to a lot of different markets to make sure where do you fall in line and then are you comfortable with potentially adding, adding more units if you are a high percent potential market area. Now keep in mind, I would just say as, as, a, as a comment to that, keep in mind that most market feasibility reports are going to factor into your demand calculation um, future projects and you know um, projects that might be under construction. I, I don't think that this particular perspective relative to construction versus um, existing inventory um, is is a is a big red flag as it relates to not being demand. I think I think a lot of market studies still come back and show demand regardless of how high that percent is. But what it will do, and and this is really geared more towards the operators and the lenders. Um, is that it, it will likely have an impact on your fill. And so if you've projected a 24-month fill schedule for your independent living building, you may want to be a little more conservative and, and, and put it at 30 months um, just to make sure that you are covering this idea tied to um, the construction that's going on in your market area. So for the balance of our, of our conversation today, we'd like to talk a little bit about um, labor market conditions. <clears throat> and um, the, the labor market, uh, as we all know, and Senior Housing News has done a great job focusing on this and trying to provide some really good solutions for owners and operators as it relates to this crisis. But 
Um, you know, I think one of the things that we've missed the boat on from a from a market feasibility perspective is really trying to um, define a correlation between the health of the labor market in a specific primary market area as tied to um, the net need or the demand that's going on in that market area. Um, we have seen, and we actually have a case study here that we're going to share with you, we have seen market areas where there is significant demand for senior living, but um, the ability to hire staff um, is, is almost impossible. And as an owner or an operator or a, de a developer, I would want to know what the health of that labor market is so that I can be sure that I'm going to be able to find staff to fill that building. Um, so in this, in this uh, slide here, we're just talking about the, the numbers um, that we know it's going to take uh, well into the future to, to, to hire staff. So the U.S. employment dropped by over 2% between 2000 and 2010. That, however, the healthcare employment sector grew by more than 25% in that same period. Um, when you look at uh, the, the need to fill um, new and existing jobs, including replacement positions for, for staff turnover, um, just on the registered nurses alone, and we've been talking about the nursing crisis for years, we're going to need over 1.2 million new RNs um, by 2020 to, to fill all of the positions and manage and handle our, tur our turnover, our staff turnover. Um, each one of these uh, lines represents a different uh, caregiver and, and the impact on our industry is going to be significant. And so understanding the health of that labor market is really, really critical. Um, the next slide really, uh, it actually comes from our colleagues at uh, mycnajobs.com and um, they have done a lot of market research and data research specific to uh, the labor market, and it's interesting, this is specific to caregiver facts, um, and, and this is um, identifying exactly where um, those CNAs want to work, and you can see uh, that a nursing home is the last place that they want to work, um, and, and honestly, a hospital or private family is probably um, the, the first place that they want to work, and so um, we, we've been pinched in the labor industry, um, by, by home and community-based services and hospitals for years, and you can tell here that that, that trend it probably isn't going to get any better. And so understanding that is very, very critical as you um, go to open new projects. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting is that 64% of your caregivers, your direct line caregivers, are always looking for a new job. Um, and we know that money isn't always the motivator for our, our caregivers and staff, but for a lot of them it is. Um, and 32%, and the balance of those caregivers, may not be looking for a new job, but if you've got an aggressive organization that's out there actively recruiting, 32% um, of those people would entertain a, a new job offer. So recognizing the dynamics specific to each uh, caregiver sector that you're um, employing is really, really important. So this is, this is an interesting case study. Um, it's a community that was uh, located just south of the Twin Cities, um, about an hour west of um, Rochester, Minnesota, where uh, the Mayo Clinic and Mayo Hospital Health System is, is located. And um, they, at that time, they had 48 independent living apartments, 15 assisted living apartments, 105 um, long-term care beds, and 16 um, TCU beds. The market study did show significant demand for um, assisted living apartments um, and assisted living memory care. And if you look at the bottom, um, at the time that the market study was conducted in 2011, um, existing independent living was at 96% and assisted living was at 100% occupancy. And, and the, the occupancy was, you know, strong across all of the competitors. They um, decided to move forward with the project and, and they um, repositioned their entire campus to include the um, new unit configuration of 48 IL, 25 AL, 21 MC apartments, and then reduced, and it's a good thing that they did, um, their long-term care beds from 105 to 61, and they maintained their TCU unit at 16 beds. Um, these guys uh, have since uh, defaulted, actually, on the bonds <laughs> um, because they could not find staff. 
uh, and they had to hold beds and could not do admissions of residents. So I think that I just want to point out, like, market study was positive, lots of demand needed, wait lists everywhere, the current place was, you know, completely full. Penetration rates were great. Everything looked great. What what don't we typically look at is the ability to find the staff, and these guys defaulted because they couldn't find staff. Right. It, it, it's really remarkable. So they had um, a, a, almost an on average 85% turnover uh, for staff across their entire health system um, from skilled nursing to independent living. Um, and, and we know that industry best practices is 20 to 30%. Those organizations that are struggling with 50, I, I can't even imagine an 85% turnover. In this particular instance, they, these guys had more than $250,000 in pool staff um, requirements. And, and going back and looking at why some of the reasons were for their inability to hire staff and the reasons for turnover, part of it was that they were paying lower wages than, than the area hospital and, and Mayo was. Um, and that's hard to compete with, right, because it's mostly a reimbursed world that we live in. Um, there were a ton of healthcare providers in that market. The unemployment rate was 3.2%, uh, lower than what the average was in, in Minnesota. Um, their CNA certification programs were at capacity because of some of the state return to work programs um, that each of the counties were, were um, pushing out into the market area. Um, and, and interestingly enough, their community policy of drug testing also had an impact. You can see that in this particular case study, Mayo Clinic added 320,000 new square feet um, on their Ro Rochester, Minnesota campus. They also tripled in size in their Cannon Falls. Um, location, which is not far from where this site was. Uh, uh, the New Ulm Medical Center increased capacity by 50%, and, and the Hormel Institute right in Austin, where this property was, created another 125 new health sector jobs. Um, these, guys, these guys were behind the eight ball before they even started with all of this additional work going on and, and healthcare jobs needed in the market area. And I, I think if, if there had been a greater focus on the labor, the health of the labor, labor market, I'm not sure that they would have moved forward with this project. One other thing, too, is, you know, Mayo Clinic started busing people from their location to the Rochester. They were, how many, was it 30, 40 miles no, away? No, it was, it was an hour away. An hour away, and they started busing people from where this facility was located to their Mayo Clinic site because they knew they needed the staff, and obviously they were paying more, so people were taking those jobs over that. The other thing to keep in mind of is when you're looking at some of these studies and you're trying to figure out, do, will you have the ability to fill your building with staff? Forget residents for a second. Let's look at it. Can we, can we hire the staff that we need? Um, let's look at how your, not only do your wage rates compare to other healthcare-like jobs, but potentially uh, waiter and wait staff uh, and fast food restaurants, similar type payment jobs. If those are also above the area you guys or, or, or owners, operators are paying, and we need to make sure that we're in line with that because a, a big indicator here would have been they were below a lot of that along with other health care spots. And unemployment is counterintuitive. Unemployment was low, which means folks are looking for jobs. If there's not, they're not available. So when they find a potential better job, they're leaving and going to a better spot. And that's a big indicator that, we, that could have been thrown up as a red flag in this, in this market study. Lana, we'll turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Dana, for that remarkable case study. It really does demonstrate uh, the need that, that we need to do to take a deep dive at the market level conditions, including the unemployment rate and the growth of declines in key indus industry sectors that may compete for our skilled labor. Because um, we really want to avoid those, those errors of omission that can set up a property for those types of unexpected challenges. So today, as uh, Jamie discussed earlier, market feasibility studies consider uh, primary demographic and competitive characteristics of a primary market area, among other factors. But um, as we've established, it's also important to uh, take into consideration the labor market characteristics. Uh, these characteristics not only include the availability and type of worker that can be offered a job, but as Jamie mentioned, other uh, competition from other industry sectors that exist for the same potential employee, like the fast food workers versus your, fat, your, sorry, your food staff. Um, it's much more relevant now than it had been in the past, but the unemployment rate at the national level in May was 4.3%. And we're 
we're starting to see upward pressure on wage rates, not just in seniors' housing, but across industries. Also, attrition within the seniors' housing labor force is presenting challenges. And considering the development and inventory growth that we've been seeing in the senior living industry, a lot of operators, instead of hiring off the street, well, they're poaching from existing properties because those employees are trained seasoned workers already, and they're doing this by offering better wages and better benefits. Now, if you look at the uh, expense load of a typical senior housing operator, 50 to 60 percent is wages and benefits, and of course, this percentage would be higher for, for a skilled nursing operator. So it's a labor-intensive business that includes an executive director, marketing staff, kitchen staff, caregivers, and uh, a whole lot of other staff members. So if I'm an operator or an investor and I'm looking at a potential opportunity, it's important for me to understand my assumptions for wage rates at the community level versus other standards for wages in that geography. I may also want to understand what the number of specific jobs like RNs are in, in the market relative to the greater share of the employment base, because I want to try to uncover hidden labor challenges like we saw in that case study. So if I'm considering opening a skilled nursing facility and there are relatively few RNs in that market, I may need to assume that I'll have to either compete very fiercely for RNs and likely pay more wages um, or rethink going into that market at all. So, to make it easier to assess the labor and wage rate issues in and across geographies, the NICMAP Data Service today launched a new tool for clients on the NICMAP web platform. Uh, NICMAP's Bureau of Labor Statistics Employment and Wage Report is a new report that customizes data from five different BLS data files collected from the BLS Occupational Employment Statistics Survey. And with the data, uh, it's easily, and while the data is pretty easily acquired from the BLS, and you can go straight to their website, this report is really designed to give operators, developers, um, underwriters, capital providers the uh, easy ability to benchmark the occupation-specific wage rates being used in business plans and pro forma models against national and state-level figures. So the BLS, well, it collects information at the occupation level, and those occupation types are segmented by industry. Uh, the report tracks three industry codes, and those are skilled nursing, CCRC, and AL, which would include uh, independent living together, and a more generic health care set of codes. Also note, uh, for, for those who have adopted the life plan community to describe the CCRC category, note that we're using the government nomenclature here. We're following the way that the government reports it for CCRC. <coughs> Now specifically, this report provides state and national employment data and corresponding annual and hourly wages across occupations um, for the skilled nursing and the CCRC and assisted living segments. Um, in addition, the report gives statewide metropolitan area comparisons of key occupational job titles and shows employment levels along with corresponding annual and hourly wages across these occupations. So for example, if you work in a hospital and you're a nurse, your occupation would be nurse but your place of employment would be a hospital opposed to a senior living community or a skilled nursing facility. All those different industry categories are called NAICS codes, N-A-I-C-S, and it stands for North American Industry Classification System. And uh, for those who can remember before NAFTA, uh, they used to be called SIP codes, which stood for Standard Industrial Classification. Go ahead and change the slide. All right, I want to show you a few of the worksheets, um, the actual reports that are in this uh, tool. So the screenshot here is an example of one of several um, BLS employment and wage reports available on the website. Um, and you can see these today if you're a NICMAP subscriber. So here we see a portion of the employment and wage details for nine of the 17 separate occupations that are relevant to the seniors housing and care sector for the state of California. Um, including a state to national index level. So to interpret this information, um, a, a quick glance at this table tells us that there are, are nearly 90,000 workers employed in the CCRC and assisted living makes industry classification groupings in 2016 uh, with an average wage of 32,000 per year. And, and if you look to the far right um, in that column, the wage index versus national shows it to be 4% above the national average. And as shown in the last visible row in this table, 
Greater than one-third of these workers were employed in the personal care and service occupations, where wages averaged 25000 per year, which was um, about 3% above the national average. And the next screenshot, um, this is some state-level data. Um, and as you can see from, we'll start with the top row where it says skilled nursing NAICS code. That's the specific industry code for skilled nursing. And if you could scroll to the right, this is just a screenshot, but once you're in the tool, if you could scroll to the right, you would see another section for the CCRC NAICS codes. And then if you scroll further to the right, uh, you see the more generic healthcare set of codes. So while not shown in this table, there are many detailed occupations below these main categories. Um, within the personal care and service occupations category alone, there are seven subcategories, uh, which include recreation workers, personal care aides, and first-line supervisors of personal service workers, among many others. So let's look at column A and B. And we need to actually backtrack this one. Um, when we're looking at column A and B, we can see the occupations. And the ones that are visible in the screenshot are management and healthcare practitioners. And under that are the subcategories. Um, each occupation has a specific OES code. If you scroll down column B, you'll see that there are uh, 114 occupation titles. So let's look at row 38. Under row 38, the occupations are dietitians, nutritionists, pharmacists, occupational therapists, and their OES occupational code. Um, moving your eyes to the right, um, this is a state level. It shows the number of people in California labeled within the skilled nursing industry code that happens to be healthcare practitioners. And so that the total equals 39,750 in the state of California. And although not shown in the screenshot of that 39,000 plus, uh, the most people in that job classification are the licensed nurse practitioners or the licensed vocational nurses. And moving your eyes over to column E is the hourly wage rate. So on average, a healthcare practitioner in the state of California earns uh, $31.28 an hour. So if an operator's um, wage rates are hovering around $25, uh, when the local average is just over 30, the data may pretend a staffing issue or, or even explain employee attrition. And one can use this information also for prospecting markets. So if, if the wage for healthcare workers is $30 in one state and $45 in another, the operator or investor may wish to consider going into one or the other. So if I were a developer, the um, information might influence the location, or if I'm, if I'm an investor, it may give me an indication of what kinds of returns I could expect to achieve in that market. Now, before we move on, looking at column J, I just want to point out that NICMAP has calculated an index that helps with comparison. Um, for all occupations, the average rate, wage rate in California is 16% higher than it is nationally. And if you could keep scrolling to the right, um, that data would be available for the CCRC and AL category and also the general health care um, category as well. Okay, moving on um, to slide 15, sorry, 34. Um, just want to briefly touch on a couple of other things that are included in this uh, report. There are 13 worksheets that drill, drill down pretty deep into the specific subcategories of occupations that are relevant to the senior housing and care sector. Um, and, each, and on each one, there are going to be a couple of graphical representations of the data, so it makes it much easier to look at and quickly um, understand the information as opposed to looking at all those numbers on a spreadsheet. So for example, this chart, which displays um, at the top of the occupation subcategory worksheets, it compares the occupation-specific wage rates across all the metropolitan areas and all the NICS codes within a state. And this means that um, the data is not limited to workers within the seniors housing sector, but it includes all workers for the indicated job title. So a community or developer could see that how their wages for food service staff stack up next to those with the same job title, but in different industries. And the next slide. Um, out of this report, we can also get state level comparisons. So here, the California Nursing Assistance by NAICS code chart shows that the, uh, the average wage rate for nursing assistance in California is less for skilled nursing and CCRC and assisted living than for all industries in aggregate. So without a doubt, I think we can just say that um, the issue of labor is going to continue to be a long-term concern for this industry. Um, 
you know, and it's NICS aimed to provide access to relevant data that will continue to move the industry forward. So with that, I'm going to uh, go ahead and turn it back over to Jamie to discuss other aspects of useful data. And I, actually, I'll take it, Lana. Thank you. I, I feel like we're on a news program here. <laughs> Throw it back to you, Lana. Um, <laughs> anyway, very quickly, we just want to talk a little bit about non-income assets. One of the things that, that all market studies do is focus on um, you know, the uh, income, and they, it also focuses on home values for older adults. And the premise behind that historically has been that, you know, obviously the residents are going to tap into their um, actual income um, to pay for rent and services. Um, and then any, any um, asset that they have tied up in their house, they would be able to dip into that to help offset some of the costs for senior living. And the reality is, is that um, we are moving into a, a, a situation where a number of older adults simply don't have the net worth in order to be able to afford um, some of the communities that are being developed today. And we think that, um, you know, moving forward from a market feasibility standpoint, we need to also spend a little more time looking at the actual net worth of the older adults potentially that would be moving into our community. You can see here that 50% of households 55 and older have actually no retirement savings, which would include any home that they might own. 40% of the 65 plus population um, would fall below the poverty level if there was no Social Security. And, and um, the amount saved by people nearing retirement, honestly, is, is really only about $136,000. So, so you know, we need to understand what those numbers are, so that so that we know that going into the opening of a new community or filling um, vacant units. So, if you look, so let's let's look at some of the growth in not only home equity, but but really some growth in the amount of debt uh, people are holding um, as they've moved throughout the time from 1995 to 2013. So, if we look at home equity and how they, how a senior or even just anyone over the age of 65 measures their average net worth, 50% of them have their net worth um, tied up in some form or fashion in their home, which I don't think is any big surprise. I think we all know that a lot of our, our uh, net worth is tied up in our, our, our homes that we own. But what's interesting is when you actually start looking at how much debt people are, are starting to hold and how it's been trending over the last couple decades. What we see is um, back in 1995, 22% of people held a mortgage on their home. And flash forward to 2013, that number has increased to 38%. And basically what that's showing us is a lot more people obviously are either not paying off their mortgages or potentially, um, and we've seen a lot of articles out there now written about this where um, a lot of folks as they, in the baby boomer generation, as they've continued to age, they have made um, career pro progress throughout their life, and instead of remaining in their home for two, three, four decades, they've upgraded into a new home, uh, potentially after a couple, couple uh, promotions, and then a promotion after that, maybe they upgraded again. And so they're carrying just larger uh, balances on their mortgage, which, which could start to weigh a little bit on uh, the amount of net worth that they have available to them when they do choose to potentially move into a senior living setting. So one of the things that we're really starting to focus on a lot more is uh, not only factoring in um, the information that we pull on the average home value in a particular market area, and that's what our, our table here on the left is showing. You can see at the bottom here, uh, you have $162,000 of the average home value in this particular market area example. And what we then want to start have started to compare this to is what's the average net worth in that market area? And what we have found is, again, back to that uh, acceptable spread that I was talking about earlier on, on some of the penetration rates, if we were to shift the age, age cohort that we're looking at, what's the acceptable spread on the amount of net worth a particular market area has when you compare it to the average home value? And one would, one would think potentially that if your net worth number is much closer to that home value number, that could indicate that their people really don't have a lot of equity tied up in their, um, don't have a lot of equity in their homes. They maybe have a large, large mortgage still sitting out there and they're relying on potentially a few other um, 
benefit plans or pension funds that they may, may be having or 401ks, and that's all that they have as far as their, their net worth. So we're starting to look at a lot more what are these two numbers you know, on a standalone basis and then comparing them and seeing what's that acceptable spread to make sure that uh, a senior, when they do move into our community, will be able to pay with some of the income that they have as well as have a decent amount of spend down um, throughout the remainder years of their life. So that is the end of our presentation. We really appreciate you um, tuning in and listening today. I think the, the big takeaways are, um, I, I think we need to, first of all, I know we need to spend a lot more time as owners, operators, investors, actually reading the market studies that our market study providers are giving to us. It is data rich. It is great information to help us um, be successful um, from whatever perspective we're coming uh, to a project in. Um, I would also say that for those of you that routinely order market studies, I think I think you need to start asking some of the questions specific to um, the, the different elements that we need to be looking at, whether it's labor, whether it's net worth, whether it's penetration rates. Um, I, I think we're, we're going to need to up our game here in order to continue to get this right, particularly as it relates to all the competition coming into the market area. So with that, Liz, we will turn it over to you for the Q&A portion. Yes. Um, so just a reminder, if you do have questions, please feel free to submit them. Um, and we have a few questions here for the panel. So one question is with respect to supply of labor. labor. Um, have you found an issue with location of a community versus location where the workers can afford to live? And is that something that you've looked at? So in other words, um, perhaps um, a high-end community where most of the labor lives you know, say an hour plus away, um, how does sure. that factor in? Yeah, that, that's, that's a really great question. And it's, it's funny, I was talking to a colleague of mine just last month uh, who is a regional director of operations for Ecumen. And uh, she's got a, a, a property in northern Minnesota in Detroit Lakes. And there's significant demand, and they're doing fantastic up at their Detroit Lakes campus. But their biggest struggle is um, an ability for people to be able to afford the housing in the Detroit Lakes market because it is a, um, it's a destination location. It is a, a, a retirement location um, and also a lake place. So everybody's up there, and these lake homes are very, very expensive. And one of the things that they're trying to do in working with the county and working with um, the local area is, is to try and identify more affordable workforce housing. So I, I do think that that is a, a significant issue and, and a point well taken that should be considered as a part of the market feasibility analysis. We should be looking at whether we think that a $13 an hour home health aid can afford to live in that market where we've got the community. Um, so that's, that's a very good point. And yes, it is a problem and we do need to look at it. Um, here's a question with respect to um, actually looking at ages lower than the 75-year-old threshold for a pure independent living facility. Um, is that something that you've looked into? And I guess maybe a follow-on to this is with acuity rising, how is that impacting some of the age considerations um, that are included in these feasibility studies? I think it's, I think it's a really good question. I, I would say... Um, you know, one way to look at it is, you know, I don't necessarily disagree that you could potentially attract a senior, you know, in their late 50s, 60s, early 70s if um, it's truly a kind of act, very active adult. Um, there may be some amenities there, maybe not. It really kind of functions more of as a, a true senior apartment setting as opposed to a um, facility that's set up on more of a campus setting. What we have what we feel is a lot of times, or majority, obviously there are plenty of exceptions out there, but really kind of looking at if you have an independent living uh, community along with assisted living and memory care, potentially skilled nursing on a campus, um, what you tend to attract is somebody who might think, you know, subconsciously maybe even, that they're moving into a, a facility and they, get, they kind of have everything that they need for the remaining years of their life. So. It's a great question. I think you you have to kind of take it circumstance by circumstance there. Um, we have obviously run or can obviously run uh, uh, analyses where you look at lower age gaps, but then I think you also can then kind of run that sensitivity 
what if you go, let's say you run at a 65 plus and then a 75 plus and then an 85 plus. And then we kind of judge, you know, how does that, how does that um, measure out to see is there, if it's still showing demand throughout that whole thing, I think that's really a good positive indicator. If you see a major drop off from that 65 plus to the 75 uh, plus and even 85, then maybe you start having a much more in-depth conversation, do a deeper dive in the analysis. Yeah, I'd like to add a little bit to that. Um, you know, I think it's really important also to get a read on, uh, try to get a read on the, the age of the folks that are com coming into the community by looking at the competition. Um, who are they attracting? What are their ages? What are their, uh, what, what is the, um, the sense of uh, acceptance of senior living in the marketplace? You know, it may be uh, more or less accepted. There may be folks that are, uh, you know, there may be a, a a tradition of, of moving into a senior living community at the later ages that may be hard to um, kind of market against going forward. But I think that it's really important to get down and look at um, the market at the ground level and really try to understand the, um, the dynamics of the attitudes and the awareness of the folks that are going to be uh, moving into the communities there and those that already exist. I think that's a really great point, and that kind of really almost ties into that, that slide we showed on, on how penetration rates are obviously going to vary broadly across what market you're in. Um, the average age of someone moving into a potential facility might vary much depending on where that facility is located as well. So that's a great point, Lana. Yeah, and I, I just have to add one more thing. I, I think it's really important that we're all very careful not to assume that if we build something for younger seniors, younger seniors are going to move in really need to take a look at the marketplace and understand who you're, you're, you're going to be, uh, who your residents are going to be. There are a couple of different questions um, with respect to the source of information on net worth or assets. Um, is there any short answer to that? So, yeah, a very quick answer on where we pulled that data and where we pull in most of our studies is a source called ESRI, E-S-R-I. And they and they track all all of those sorts of data points. They track it, yeah. They do it everything by uh, zip code, or you can even drill Got down it. even further than that. But we pull it by zip code most majority of the time. And then a question for Lana, um, too, just about the data that Nick is making available with respect to labor. So um, is that on a state by state basis? Does it go any closer down on the market level? Um, can you just expand a little bit? Yeah, it, it, it tracks the national level, it gives you comparisons to the state level, and there are also some comparisons to the metropolitan level. However, um, the BLS doesn't make available um, metropolitan level data at the uh, occupation code level. So what we've done in the database is to um, aggregate that information so that if you remember that blue chart, or the chart with the blue bars that I showed you, um, that shows the different occupation codes um, across the different industries. So you can get that across different industries at the metropolitan level um, for the state. Um, back to the question or the topic of net worth, household net worth. Um, is there any indication as to how much people are willing to spend on their net worth versus income um, when you've looked at that? And this is probably a question for Jamie and Dana. How much they're willing to, well, so the, I know there is information out there where you could actually break it up by age cohort and it shows you um, the percent of people by different age cohorts that, that have a mortgage on their home. So you can slice and dice some of that data to look at, you know, if your particular market area has a home value of 200000 and and, you know, 50% of that market has a mortgage on it, then we can, make, you know, discount that potentially to say that number needs to be discounted out and factored into um, our net worth. But the net worth calculation that we're showing here does include home values in there with, with um, debt backed out, any debt that they have. So not only home mortgages, but... Uh, vehicle debt that they have or, or um, unsecured like credit card debt, et cetera. Got it. Um, this is a question about considerations for 
board and care. Um, the board board and care, I guess, as it exists with respect to senior housing communities that you're looking at, is that something that you consider um, from a feasibility standpoint? Uh, I'm sorry, the question was about board and care um, housing nationally, which I know it exists in some places, not others, but um, mm -hmm. is that something that you consider as well? Well, it would get picked up as a part of the analysis that would be done as a, a, mm -hmm. the competitor, so we would look at that. You may have a conversation though. You know, we have this often where you pick up a competitor, then when you're talking with the owner operator, they may say, you know, we are not serving that population whatsoever, so we want to discount some of their units out when we're calculating the, the unit potential. We can do that, but we always will do at least run, one run at what does it look like if you factor every single unit that's in your market area in there, just to make sure we're running a conservative approach to see how that affects some of that unit potential. Another really good example, Liz, would be when we do affordable housing market feasibility um, work, we, we do actually um, look at all of, you know, there's a lot of affordable assisted living coming online these days, and we will get asked to do a market analysis for that. And when we look at typical HUD buildings, um, we, will, we will, even though they're not providing services in those buildings, we will consider that somewhat competitive to an affordable assisted living project because, you know, residents who live in those um, affordable housing facilities that have an actual project-based subsidy, it's going to take an act of Congress to get them out of there to give up their subsidy and move into another location. They're going to wait until the very end. And so we do con consider them somewhat competitive because they can bring services in. Got it. I think that's a really good point. Um, a question here, another with regard to labor. Um, with many senior housing employees being immigrants, um, have you considered any analysis of the impact of lower immigration rates on the labor supply um, for the industry or in certain markets? Well, we, we do know that, that um, immigration is going to be uh, a challenge going forward and it's going to help um, drive issues with regard to you know, getting appropriate labor staffed in our communities. Um, so I think going forward it's just something that we're going to have to take a look at. Um, very big picture, maybe this is a question that we could um, wrap up on, but um, with all of these different factors affecting market studies, do you think these considerations will lead to needing to spend more money on site or project due diligence in the future? Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, 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 is, is this sort of a new normal? I mean, there are a lot of factors that are changing. so. Um, well, it's very connection. interesting. To, it's very interesting to me, Liz, because I I think that you know we often get phone calls and they'll say, hey, we want you to do a market study for X Y Z. You know, how much is that going to cost? And we'll put a number out there, and it's not an exorbitant amount of money, but people gasp, you know. And and you know, a, a eight or ten or twelve thousand dollar market study is a small amount to pay to get a significant amount of data that hinges on the success of an of, of a particular project that you might be dropping thirty, forty, fifty million dollars on. Um, so I I I think that it's it's really important to recognize the, the incredible value that these market studies can provide to us and and if we just take the time to review them and read them and and, and get into the details um, there's a lot of stuff in there that's going to help us be successful yeah, and, and you know if you think about it how did we arrive on this pretend, this this webinar topic and it was the conversation of there's so much happening in this industry there are very experienced operators doing a ton of development and acquisitions and then there are a ton of uh, new entrants into this industry and with all of that uh, very large influx of new units and new properties coming online, let's make sure that we're not still just doing a very back of the envelope calculation on a, on a market demand uh, analysis to determine is this a market we want to invest in because to Dana's point, we're investing a boatload of money into a lot of these projects and the last thing we want to do is skimp on a very, very relatively, if you think about it in the grand scheme of things, cheap service to make sure that, that this market that you're investing in 
is going to support your property, not only um, currently, but well into the future. Thanks. And then I guess one final question um, that I have is with labor considerations being such an important part of this analysis today, um, how much, you know, how, I guess, how, yeah, how much of your kind of time and attention is devoted to that relative to, say, 10 years ago? How big is the labor issue here? It's huge. We weren't looking at labor at all as a part of our market feasibility practice 10 years ago. And today, I can't imagine looking at any project from a development or owner operator standpoint without having a clear understanding of the impact that a labor force is going to have. I, I don't know why you would ever do a market study without um, analyzing that labor pool. Um, it, it, it just is a recipe for disaster in so many different market areas. So I, I think they have to go hand in hand. Um, and from my perspective, that is the new, that will become the new normal moving forward um, and should be a, a part of the market feasibility work that, that all of us are doing. Thank you. Well, thank you to everyone for your perspectives um, and thank you to our audience for your attention and questions today. Um, as I mentioned, a copy of the slides and a recording of the presentation will be made available via email, so watch out for that coming soon. And thanks to all. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.